Spiritual Ministration, Chapter 1, The Early Years. Draksharam is a small village in the East Godavari district of Andhra Pradesh. Though little more than a hamlet today, it has an interesting history. According to local legend, Draksharam was known in the past as Dakshavati and was reputed to be the place where Raja Daksha held his great yajna or sacrifice according to Vedic rites. It was during this yajna that his daughter Dakshayani or Sati, the consort of Lord Shiva, immolated herself when her father slighted Mahadev, her husband. Local tradition also maintains that the great sage Vyasa performed tapas and attained Siddhi at Draksharam. The presiding deity of Draksharam is Bhimeshwar Mahadev, manifested in the form of a Swayambhu Lingam or self-evolved emblem of Shiva. This is known as the Bhimeshwar Lingam. This Lingam is located amidst peaceful surroundings in a shady grove comprising of a banyan tree and some Morgosa trees. It is this Bhimeshwar Lingam which inspired the great devotional outpourings of the renowned Telugu poet Srinath. A little more than a kilometer away from Dakcharam, nestling among groves of palmyra and coconut palms is the quiet little hamlet of Adivara Pupeta. A small canal known locally as the Godavari Canal flows along the outskirts of this hamlet. In order to reach Adivara Pupeta, one has to travel on the Madras Haura railway line up to Raja Mahindram or Raja Mundri. From here, one has to travel by bus to Draksharam, a distance of approximately 45 kilometers. From Draksharam, one can hire a taxi or a rickshaw or simply walk down. From the direction of Howrah, one has to detrain at Samalkot railway station and from here take a bus to Draksharam via Kakinada. The distance from Samalkot to Draksharam is also about 45 kilometers. Parentage The inhabitants of Adivara Pupeta belong predominantly to the Devanga community, whose principal vocation is the weaving of cloth, primarily dhotis and saris, and then marketing this produce to the nearby towns and villages. Some three decades ago, there lived at Adivara Pupeta a man named Allaka B. Manna, who, like the majority of his fellow villagers, belonged to the Devanga community. His wife was Shravanamma, who belonged to the village of Bandaru Lanka, which is located at a distance of approximately 20 kilometers from Adivara Pupeta. As the couple did not have any children, B. Manna, with the consent of Shravanamma, decided to marry again. His second wife was Parvatamma, the daughter of Goli Satyam, who belonged to his own village of Adivara Pupeta. Birth In due course, Parvatamma bore for her husband two daughters and two sons. The youngest of these four children, a boy who was born on the 24th of January 1935, was named Satyaraju by his parents. This boy later became renowned as Sri 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 Shivabala Yogi Maharaj. When Satyaraju was two years old, Shravanamma, the first wife who was still childless, got the approval of her husband and of Parvatamma to be allowed to rear Satyaraju as her own son. Passing away of Bhimanna. Bhimanna often used to tell Parvatama that their younger son Satyaraju was destined to make a great name for himself and that he would bring great honor to the family, but that he, Bhimanna, would not live to see it. And so it came to pass in the month of July 1937, when Satyaraju was barely two and a half years old, his father Bhimanna passed away. The two widowed wives separated and returned to their respective parental homes. Shravanamma left for her native village, Bandaru Lanka, and Parvatamma went to live with her father, Goli Satyam. As Satyaraju was too young to be separated from his mother, Shravanamma left him with Parvatamma for the time being. Later, 
when Satyaraju was five years old, Shravanamma came to fetch him and took him away with her to Bandharulanka to bring him up as her own son, as had been agreed to earlier. Six months later, Parvatamma came on a visit to Bandharulanka and as Satyaraju wished to return to Adivara Pupeta with his mother, the boy returned to Adivara Pupeta with the consent of Shravanamma. Childhood Days at Adivara Pupeta As mentioned earlier, Shravanamma was now living with her father Goli Satyam. Goli Satyam was a poor man and the added burden of having to support his widowed daughter and her children. He found it hard to maintain his family. Therefore, though Satyaraju was enrolled in the local village school on his return to Adivara Pupeta, he had to do his share of work at home also. The daily pattern of his childhood during this period alternated between work and play. His day began at 5 a.m. After a bath and a light breakfast of curds and rice, he worked at the looms up to 10 a.m., dexterously weaving cloth in vivid hues, which was a specialty of their family. After a hurried lunch, he would attend school between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. When the school was over, the boys went out to play until they were called home to dinner, which was around 6 p.m. At the evening meal, Satyaraju would sit with his maternal grandfather, Goli Satyam, for an hour or more and tell him what happened during the day. Goli Satyam listened to the boy's account with interest and also availed of, his op of this opportunity to impart valuable advice and instruction to his grandson. Thereafter, around 7 p.m., Satyaraju would join one of the many Kirtan parties if they happened to be holding a Kirtan or he would go out and again play with his friends. At this time of the day, the boys would often learn and practice the use of the sword and the lati, and Satyaraju proved to be one of the most avid and proficient pupils in this ancient art. Finally, around 10 p.m., the boys used to go to bed. It was indeed a hard life, particularly for a young child who was barely six years old, but it was no different from the life followed by the children of the poor in, the, in most of India's innumerable villages. It was the penalty they had to pay for their poverty. While poverty has been endemic in India for centuries, it has failed to corrupt or degrade the poor of our country. In fact, in rural India, where the poorest of the poor of India live, we often find qualities of character which are conspicuously absent in the more prosperous cities. Thus, though Goli Satyam was poor, he was a spirited old man with a deep sense of honor and self-respect. He would repeatedly counsel the members of his family, and particularly the children, that poverty, though unfortunate, is not a sin, and hence nothing to be ashamed of. One should never beg or be dependent on others, nor should nor be under any obligation to anybody else. One should live honorably and by honest means, even though such a way of life may be more difficult to follow. And though in the insincerity and falsehood must be shunned at all costs. Satyaraju loved and respected his grandfather, and as we have already related, he would spend some time every evening in the company of the old man, listening with rapt attention to his worldly wise advice and exhortations. During these sessions, the impressionable young mind of Satyaraju would soak up the wise counsels of his grandfather, and thus Goli Satyam came to exercise a beneficial and lasting influence on the views and character of his favorite grandchild. Grandfather's Influence Satyaraju adored his grandfather and Goli Satyam in turn deeply loved Satyaraju and predicted a bright future for him. As time went by, Satyaraju came to treat his grandfather as his most trusted confidant. 
he would scrupulously abide by the counsels given to him by this old man and would unhesitatingly carry out his directions. An interesting example of this can be seen in the following story. Satyaraju was sent one day to Ramachandrapuram for some work. When he was leaving, his grandfather told him that though they had many relatives in Ramachandrapuram, they were all likely to show scant courtesy and regard. He should therefore conduct himself with dignity in their presence and should not visit their homes unless invited to do so. Now it so happened that it was nearly 11 o'clock at night by the time Satyaraju was able to finish his work. In the normal course, he could have gone to the house of any one of his relatives for the night where he would have been assured of a good meal and comfortable bed. However, remembering his grandfather's counsel, the boy, who was barely eight years old at the time, chose to spend the night in the verandas or portico of a closed shop regardless of the inconvenience and discomfort this entailed, and came back early the next morning. When he related this to his grandfather on his return, Goli Satyam was very happy at the nerve and resolve shown by Satyaraju, and he was reassured more than ever before that his grandson had a bright future ahead of him. Satyaraju goes to live with his stepmother. In January 1943, when Satyaraju was in his eighth year. His stepmother Shravanamma came on a visit to Adivara Pupeta and with the concurrence of Parvatamma and Goli Satyam, she took Satyaraju with her. At his new home in Bandarulanka, Satyaraju was admitted to the local village school and he soon established himself as the leader among the boys of his group. Satyaraju was keen on his studies and proved to be a bright student. However, a promising academic career was cut short when his stepmother abruptly decided to withdraw him from school. Satyaraju resented this as he was eager to continue his studies, but his stepmother refused to oblige on the plea that she needed his help at home and as she was able to as she was unable to manage her affairs on her own. Satyaraju soon realized what this uh, help to his stepmother meant. He would be awoken early in the morning and set to work to weave cloth. The work quota assigned to him by his stepmother was to weave half a sari every day. It must be remembered that Satyaraju was barely eight years old and working long hours in the primitive and heavy loom imposed a heavy physical strain on his body. As soon as he finished his quota of weaving, Shravanama would send the boy to the market to buy cotton or to sell the finished produce of cloth. When he returned from these assignments, he was set to work on household chores. Thus, Satyaraju had to slave for his stepmother all day long, nor would she allow him to go out and play with the other boys as he did in his native village of Adivara Pupeta. That apart, Satyaraju was in the habit of eating five to six times a day, and Parvatama made sure that her children got nourishing and wholesome food. Shravanamma, on the other hand, though comparatively much better off, was very niggardly in the matter of food. Satyaraju had to be content with a light breakfast and two main meals a day. And these two were far from substantial. As a result, Satyaraju often remained hungry. The hard work, coupled with inadequate nourishment, led to a marked deterioration in the physical condition of the boy. Notwithstanding all these troubles, Satyaraju continued to work devotedly for his stepmother. However, he was not at all happy and often yearned to return to his mother and grandfather at Adivara Pupeta. Now it so happened that Shravanamma, unknown to Satyaraju, had been secretly carrying on an illicit trade in opium. One day the officials of the excise department were, lipped, uh, were tipped off that Shravanamma was in illegal possession of 40 tolas of opium and that she was keeping this hidden in her house. So a search warrant was taken out and a party came to search her residence. In the meanwhile, Satyaraju got wind of this through some of his friends and rushed home to inform his stepmother about it and asked her point blank whether 
It was a fact that she had this opium hidden in her house. Thoroughly frightened by now, Shravanamma admitted her nefarious activities and allowed Satyaraju and showed Satyaraju where she had hidden the opium. Satyaraju quickly removed it from the house and so when the search party came, they could find nothing. Though he saved his stepmother from arrest and humiliation, Satyaraju was mortified to learn from what his stepmother had herself told him that she was in fact indulging in dishonest trade practices. He severely castigated her for this and threatened to leave her and return to Adivara Pupeta if she did not give up these activities. She appeared to relent and promised to give them up, but this was only a passing phase. Satyaraju soon discovered that his stepmother had gone back to her old ways and was continuing her illicit trade in opium. Seeing that she was incorrigible, Satyaraju refused to stay with her any longer and Shravanamma too had begun to be irked by Satyaraju's constant criticism of her illicit trade practices. And so when the boy sought her permission to return to Adivara Popeta, she readily consented. Return to Adivara Popeta Satyaraju had, stayed, had barely stayed five months with his stepmother. Though this had been in many ways a trying period, it was not entirely wasted. Shravanamma had good business acumen and with his keen intelligence and observant nature, Satyaraju began managed to gain useful experience in the conduct of business, particularly in buying and marketing of produce. As a result of this experience, he became convinced that it was only by taking to business that he and his family could hope to break the shackles of poverty which had bound them for generations. Therefore, though he had been fond of studies and an eager student earlier, he did not rejoin school when he returned to Adivara Popeta. Instead, he decided to devote all his time and energies to helping his family earn a decent livelihood. He would put in long hours of work at the family looms and though Goli Satyam kept a watchful eye to make sure that his young grandson did not overstrain himself, Satyaraju nevertheless managed to put in extra hours of work on the, in the quiet. He would take the finished produce and sell it in villages and markets further afield where he managed to get a better price. He would then hand over the proceeds from his labor to his mother and grandfather. During the summer months, he would attempt to earn extra money by selling sherbet and aerated cool drinks. Thus, the compulsions of poverty forced Satyaraju to work hard to earn a living when other more fortunate boys of his age normally went to school or indulged in carefree play. But this is not to say that it was a case of all work and no play. Satyaraju was an active and intelligent boy who had been good at studies and fond of games. Though he had to perforce give up studies after his eighth year, he continued to participate in games and play along with the other boys of his age and excelled them in all feats, uh, demanding skill and athletic prowess. From the early age of six, he learned and practiced the use of the sword and the lati for defensive and offensive purposes. He had also acquired a reputation among his playmates and with the elders of his village for his fearlessness and bold outspokenness and his deeply ingrained sense of fair play and justice. All these qualities combined to make him a natural leader of the boys of his village. At the same time, he was feared and resented by those who were hypocritical or deceitful in their ways because they often became the targets of his ridicule and public exposure. There is an interesting story of this period which aptly illustrates Satyaraju's uncompromising devotion to truth and also his fearlessness. Satyaraju's uncle, who was a powerful and respected man of the village and the head of their com family and community, had become attached to, to a sadhu whom he later accepted as his guru. Now this sadhu was a boastful and pompous fellow who threatened dire consequences to anyone who crossed his path. One of his constantly repeated threats was that by his curse he could transform any erring mortal who wittingly or unwittingly incurred his wrath into one or other of some low animal species. 
the simple village folk readily believed this and hence they went about in awe and fear of this angry old man. Naturally, Satyaraju took an instant dislike to the sadhu for his pompous and bellicose manner and his angry threats. He was convinced in his own mind that the sadhu did not possess any such powers. He boasted of, and so he secretly resolved to expose him. One day, when everybody was seated in the presence of the sadhu, and he was holding forth in his usual boastful manner, Satyaraju asked the sadhu what he, the sadhu, would do uh, if someone were to pinch any of his things. I would turn him into a tiger, said the sadhu promptly. Thereupon Satyaraju pretended to express awe and wonder, but remained quiet. A short while later, the sadhu happened to go out and finding himself alone in the sadhu's room, Satyaraju quickly took his bows and arrows and hid them on a ledge just above the place where the sadhu normally slept. He then sneaked out unnoticed from the room. When the sadhu returned and found his bow and arrows missing, inquiries were made and a search conducted, but they could not be traced. Now the sadhu lost his temper and began ranting and raving about what he would do to the culprit. Satyaraju, who was an interested spectator of the whole scene, suggested in a seemingly innocent tone that the sadhu, by his powers, should be able to locate both his missing bow and arrows and, and also the culprit. This only enraged the sadhu further, and Satyaraju was quickly hustled away by anxious relatives lest the sadhu pronounce a curse on him. Awed by the sadhu's terrible anger and somewhat anxious by now as to what might happen to him, Satyaraju ran straight to his grandfather and told him in all innocence, I have hidden his bows and arrows. If the sadhu turns me into a tiger, then the people will hunt me down and kill me, so lie me up inside. Goli Satyam could not help being amused. He told the boy not to worry and to wait and see what happens. Thus, reassured by his grandfather and seeing that nothing had happened to him, uh, even though some considerable time had elapsed, Satyaraju became firm in his original conviction that the sadhu was a hoax. After some time, he presented himself before the sadhu and, with not a little trepidation, told them, in the presence of the usual gathering of his admirers, that he had hidden the sadhu's bows and arrows and showed him the hiding place. And to the astonishment and horror of his relatives, he now challenged the sadhu to transform him into a tiger, as he had been threatening to do so all along. The sadhu fretted and cursed, but Satyaraju boldly stood his ground, and nothing happened to him. Satyaraju was soundly belabored by his uncle and others for his undecorous behavior, but he had proved his point. The sadhu never again made such boasts, nor did he ever succeed in terrorizing the villagers again with his stepmother again. Sometime in the year 1947, when Satyaraju was in his twelfth year, his stepmother fell seriously ill. As she was bedridden and needed to be looked after, she sent for Satyaraju. Accordingly, Satyaraju left for Bandarulanka and nursed his stepmother on her sick bed. She soon recovered, but in spite of promises to the contrary, she once again started indulging in illicit opium trade. Though she tried to conceal this from her stepson, it did not take Satyaraju long to discover her clandestine activities, and as before he expressed his strong disapproval. This led to friction and tension between mother and son, which was aggravated by other incidents of a similar nature. The matter came to a head one night when Shravanamma was serving food to Satyaraju and spoke to him harshly about a particular incident, severely criticizing him for his conduct. Satyaraju was cut to the quick by his stepmother's unjustified abuse. He immediately got up, leaving his meal unfinished, and announced that he was leaving for Adivarapupeta that very instant. At the same time, he vowed that he would never again set foot in his stepmother's house. He collected his belongings and came out, but as it was raining heavily, he decided to wait until the morning. However, as he had vowed never to return to his uh, stepmother's house, he resolved to spend his night, spend the night in the veranda only. Stravanamma by now had relented and come out to ask Satyaraju to forgive her and requested him to come in and sleep comfortably in the room. 
However, Satyarajju refused to be persuaded and in reply to his stepmother's importunities, he simply reiterated his resolve to never set foot in his stepmother's house. Satyarajju leaves his stepmother's house for good. Early next morning, Satyarajju set off on foot for Adivara Pupeta. As he neared the Godavari River, he suddenly realized that he had no money to pay for the boat fare. There was no question of turning back at this stage, and so he racked his brain for a solution to this problem. On an impulse, he took off his shirt and decided to offer it to the boatman as payment for the boat fare. Just then, as luck would have it, he found a one and a bit lying on the road. This was the exact amount required for the boat fare, and relieved now of his anxiety in this regard, Satyaraju proceeded happily on his journey. Satyaraju is well aware that apart perhaps from his mother and grandfather, his other relatives would not approve of his having left his stepmother to return home again. So instead of proceeding directly to Adivara Pupeta, Satyaraju first went to Draksharam. He reposed great faith in Bhimeshwar Mahadev the presiding deity of Draksharam, and was deeply devoted to him. It was natural, therefore, that he should turn to his Ishtadeva in this hour of need. He came and stood before the Bhimeshwar Lingam and silently prayed to the Lord that his relatives would understand the reasons that had compelled him to leave his stepmother's house. Satisfied that the Lord had, had listened to his prayer, he then proceeded to Adivara Pupeta. As he had anticipated, his uncle and other relatives were very annoyed when they learned that he had left his stepmother and come back. He was summarily ordered by them to return to Bandaru Lanka to live with his stepmother in fulfillment of his father's pledge to her. How, however, he fortunately find, found an ally in his grandfather who, after listening to the entire account, decided that Satyaraju had done well to leave his stepmother and come away. Thus, with the backing and support of his grandfather, Satyaraju was able to counter the pressure being put on him by his other relatives. Shortly after his return, Sravanamma also came to Adivara Pupeta and pleaded to Satyaraju to return, but no amount of persuasion or threats could move him to go back on his vow to never set foot in her house again. Gradually, the pressure for his return to Bandaru Lanka died down and he was able to live in peace at Adivara Pupeta. A Business Venture The BD Shop One of the driving ambitions of Satyaraju's life, even at this young age, was to redeem his family and particularly his mother from the clutches of poverty. He soon realized that the traditional family vocation of weaving would never bring him the riches he dreamt of. In fact, in spite of hours daily slaving at the looms by all members of the family, including even the children, the family was barely able to earn enough money to ensure a subsistence level existence. Satyaraju had pondered often on this problem and as mentioned earlier, he had realized at a very early age that business was one vocation that promised quick and adequate returns. With this at the back of his mind, he was constantly on the lookout for an opening to launch a business venture. When he returned this time from Badaru Lanka, he learned that one of the boys in the village had opened a BD shop on a capital outlay of just 25 rupees and uh, his business was visibly prospering. This gave Satyaraju the idea of himself opening a similar BD shop and as was his practice, he discussed this proposal with his grandfather. Goli Satyam however, was not pleased with this idea because he felt that running a BD shop was not a dignified vocation for a member of his family. He told Satyaraju that if he wanted to do business, he should plan to become a cloth merchant, which would be a more befitting profession for a member of the Devanga community. In fact, he told him that this was what he had all along planned and hoped for whenever he thought about his grandson's future career. Satyaraju greatly respected his grandfather's views and opinions and this unexpected opposition from him proved to be a damper on his immediate plans. However, notwithstanding his grandfather's disapproval, Satyaraju did not entirely give up the idea of starting a BD shop and he would often be preoccupied with thinking about it and planning this pet project of his. 
One day, absorbed in such thoughts, he was walking along when he uh, espied a copper coin lying on the wayside. Now, finding a copper coin in this manner is considered to be a sign of impending good fortune, and taking this to be a propitious portent, he picked up the coin and pressed it reverently to his eyes and proceeded to join his playmates for a game of marbles. Whether it was the influence of the copper coin or just by his luck, Satyaraju proved unbeatable that day. By the time they finished play, Satyaraju had won marbles worth five rupees. He sold marbles uh, forth at a bound, and pocketing the money, he went straight to the shrine of Bhimeshwar Mahadev at Draksharam. Bowing before his Ishtadeva with devotion, he fervently prayed to the Lord to grant him success in his proposed venture to start a beady shop. He then returned and with his initial capital of 5 rupees started his beady business. His business prospered from the very start and he was soon making more money than he ever had through weaving. What is more, the rival beady shop for some reason was forced to close down and all the customers were transferred to Satyaraju's shop. He started making good profits and he regularly deposited the proceeds from his shop with his mother and grandfather which pleased them immensely. The objections and reservations that Goli Satyam had earlier voiced to setting up a uh, BD shop were soon forgotten. Satyaraju, of course, was highly pleased with the success of his venture and he began to make plans to further expand his business. And so time passed happily for the boy and Satyaraju soon entered his 14th year.